Okay, so we're, we're ready to get started on our program for this evening. You can keep your cameras and microphones off. And when we're ready for questions, you can raise your hand and turn on your camera to speak or just turn on your mic if you prefer. And you also have the option to just type your question in the chat box and I'll, I'll monitor the chat and uh, read out your question when the time comes. So now I'd like to introduce our special guest for tonight. Bob Babinski is one of the top performance trainers in Canada, having coached more than 500 broadcasters. He works regularly with commentators and hosts at Hockey Night in Canada and Rogers Sportsnet. At the 2016 Rio Olympics, he prepared Donovan Bailey, Mark Tewksbury, Perdita Felician, and Clara Hughes for their on-air roles. A sportscaster for CBC Montreal in the 1990s and a part-time journalism instructor at Concordia University since the year 2000, Bob is currently president of the McGill Alumni Association. Thank you for joining us, Bob. Sakuri, so you're welcome. Uh, and thank you to everybody who uh, has joined us tonight. It's a privilege to be able to speak with you and uh, to get your attention for the next hour and to talk about a topic that's really very dear to my heart. Um, and I hope over the next hour to uh, share some personal stories as to why this is so dear to my heart, but also to um, share some tips and things to, uh, either for you to use uh, for your own public speaking or for people who are just here to try to understand a bit more about what makes a, a successful public speaker when you're watching them. I think this will be quite useful today as well, or tonight. Uh, I do wanna begin though with a little riddle just to engage you mentally, just to make sure you're there and thinking. Uh, and it's and partly inspired by the Blue Jays, your baseball team in Toronto, who have tremendous uh, success early in the season. Very simple riddle, which is uh, if a bat and a ball together cost a dollar and 10 cents, and the bat is worth a dollar more than the ball, how much is the ball worth? So I'll, I'll repeat the, the riddle again, and I won't give you the answer right away, but I do want you to think about it. So again, you have the bat and the ball together are a dollar and 10. The bat is worth a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So apologies to those of you who have run away from mathematics since school. Um, but for those of you that are, are still uh, enjoying a, a mathematical riddle, do think about that when I'm going to come back to it. Uh, my goal tonight uh, is not just to, um, to play a riddle with a bat and a ball, but to get you guys uh, to think and to think uh, about public presentations and specifically what it means to speak up and what it means to take your place and to be heard. As I mentioned, some of you are hopefully looking for tips to, to take that place. And that could be at a school board meeting, that could be in a work environment, that could be at a family occasion. Um, but some of you are just, I'm sure, curious about the whole process. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I do want to share a little bit about uh, myself personally, and I can't help but bring up a story that uh, took place a couple of days ago. And this is, uh, I've just shared my screen, there's a photo with me and my father. So that's my dad, Tom Babinski. He's 88 years old, and he has Alzheimer's. So uh, I think everybody is familiar with, um, with the disease and what it does to people. In my father's case, it's actually taken away one of his most beautiful and valuable skills he had his whole life, which was as a speaker. And um, uh, in the early months and days of his Alzheimer's, the first thing that we noticed is that he lost his capacity to, to use words to identify things like a glass. And then with time, his language has slowly disappeared. So there's other things, of course, that come with Alzheimer's. Um, this photo is from just a couple of days ago. We went to get our haircut together. And this has become a ritual in the last couple of years. This is a moment where we can, we can share uh, an activity together, which doesn't involve conversation. And as we walked into the vestibule at my parents' house, my mother took out her camera because she could see this moment that we are having and she, she snapped this. And I have to say, this is like a really special thing for me to be able to continue to communicate with my dad, even though we're not using our words. I should mention as well that, you know, in terms of my inspiration, uh, and my model for being able to speak publicly, my dad was certainly that person. 
So his career was in communications. He worked in public relations. He spoke French and English and Polish, but his work was in French and English. He could write as well as anybody and he could speak as well as anybody. And I still remember that um, at family functions, at weddings, and I have three brothers, uh, he would be um, giving the most beautiful speeches at those gatherings, all of them very memorable. But one of the things that was a learning for me was that in the days before the actual wedding gathering or whatever the occasion was for the family, I could often hear him in his room with the door shut, rehearsing and practicing the speech that he was going to give. And there's a little clue in there that for those times when we're actually going to be speaking about something that's very close to our heart, it actually takes a little bit more preparation than normal. And so that means organizing our thoughts as much as possible. And when we can actually act out the words that we're going to be giving at a particular occasion. So um, as you can see when the, with the relationship with my dad, I, I just, it's so ironic that someone who was so good at speaking um, has lost that capacity. But maybe for me anyways, a reminder for, for those of, you who, for, of us who still have our words uh, to actually exercise that capacity to the maximum. And we'll be better at whatever we're asked to do, certainly in a public sphere, if we're able to share our words properly. From a sort of technical point of view this evening, I am gonna be talking a little bit about the preparation phase. So again, my dad practicing in his room and the things that inform the preparation phase before someone takes to the microphone publicly. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the execution phase, what I refer to as well as the delivery phase. And when this is done, Sequoia has been kind enough to uh, inform me that uh, a PDF sheet sort of summarizing some of these things will be sent to you if you'd like to have a look at it. And I'm glad to share that with you. One thing we don't think about at the preparation phase is who is in my audience? Who, who exactly is out there? And what do they want to hear? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But that's the first question we skip. And even tonight, when I was with Sequoia preparing for this presentation, I was trying to get a feel for who all of you are. And in this case, there's a bit of an assumption that I have to make because, uh, because of uh, the exercise and what it is, we're not gonna do a detailed um, research document on who all of you are and why you're here for this particular presentation. But I have a, a notion of uh, how you're here. And of course, through the chat tonight, and maybe through some of the questions that you're gonna ask, um, you'll be able to share a little bit more about that. We'll see how close I am to, to being right about why you're here. But in addition to that, as I think about the audience, I also have to think about what's motivating you. What's, why would you actually wanna to listen to me? And then once I've answered that question, the next one is, is there something that you don't already know about this that I can share with you? So this applies to all sorts of things when you're making a presentation in all sorts of milieus. So I need you to think about that as much as you can, and people need to do that if they're gonna be successful speaking publicly. Um, Practice, as I mentioned, is something that we have to do often. I also say just a little, bit, a little bit careful about practicing right up to the moment of your public speaking engagement. If you get too close to the start time, that's actually gonna probably draw fundamental energy away from you when you're actually gonna be speaking. And I'll talk a little bit about some deep breathing exercises that are related to being grounded. And these are things that uh, also, if you do in preparation for a presentation are things that'll help settle you when you're presenting, many, many people complain about the nerves. So in the delivery phase of your speech, the one thing that a lot of people, again, don't think about is, have I flipped the switch to get to my starting point? So what I mean by that is, if you are, let's say, uh, coming from one room and you're going to another room where your presentation is gonna be made, have you both psychologically and physically marked that transition to the starting point. Say, okay, you know, I was here before, none of that's important anymore. The only thing that's significant for me now is the audience that I'm speaking to and the environment that I'm in. So that's where the term that I use, flipping the switch comes into place. In smaller groups, now again, we're still in this COVID era and we're doing this remotely. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about adapting some of these concepts to the virtual world. But when you are in the same room as people, uh, number one is you want to work on eye contact as much as possible. One big mistake that people make when they're speaking to a group of five or more 
is they'll look over the heads of the people that they're speaking to. Sometimes it's a security um, blanket that they have, which is not to actually look at the people that they're speaking to. One of the advantages of looking at people, and there are several, but one of them is that it's actually gonna improve your focus and it's gonna help actually you be a little bit more clear when you speak. I call it the point of intention. So if you're actually looking at someone, there's a big, big advantage. It actually simulates what we do normally in conversation when we're in private with people. Another thing that you can take away as a quick tip is in the era where we're gonna be shaking hands, and I know for the last two plus years, this has been really difficult, but I'm sure it's coming back. If you can shake hands with people or have a physical greeting with them before you begin, that's another way to break down the natural barrier that's there when we go to speak in a public uh, forum. So if, if you're at a meeting and you're asked to speak uh, and there are minutes before it's your turn to speak and there is a chance to go up to Susan and John, whomever, and shake their hand and say, how's it going tonight? Just that act of shaking hands with people and connecting with them physically is actually gonna make it easier for you when you're uh, at the podium speaking to people. Um, the other thing is the, um, the audience that's watching you for the most part, not always, there are exceptions, but for the most part, the audience that's listening to you, they actually want you to succeed. They want you to be able to share your idea. They wanna see you smile. Um, they're not necessarily out there trying to tear you down. So some of the stuff that happens to us in childhood, unfortunately, kind of hardwires this notion that there's people out there trying to get me all the time. So I get it. And we all have had, you know, experiences that we can speak to on that front. But generally speaking with, you know, politicians is a different story. You know, if you're going to city council to make a, a presentation that's going to be, um, you know, it's not going to be warmly received. You know, people are looking at you with a critical eye. But those are exceptions. You know, for, for the most part, I think for the average person, if, if there is such a thing, uh, when you're speaking, whether it be at work or with friends at a family occasion, most people want you to succeed in that role. And just that notion is something that's going to help cut a little bit of that tension, which can build up when we're speaking. So I'd like to come back to that a little bit. However, before we do that, I want to talk um, a little bit more about where I'm at right now and how I end up here tonight speaking to you. So first of all, I'm in Montreal. And this is in my home office, which uh, after years of not really getting used because I was traveling across the country 10 to 12 days a month doing my training for people, uh, COVID hit and all my work became virtual. And so this is the office that got reconstituted and this is where I'm working from. This is the phase of my life. It's really the third kind of third act really of my professional life. So I'm going to share a few photos with you, um, which will help uh, walk through those uh, phases of my life uh, professionally. So um, the first phase professionally is uh, that phase where I was working uh, either as a host or a young reporter, uh, both in television and on radio, and uh, that eventually became uh, in the position of a uh, sportscaster. So this was a little bit unlikely. I'll explain a bit more in a, in a bit. My brothers, I have three of them older. Uh, I had a profound lisp when I was a kid. So they kind of thought I was the last person who would ever make it uh, to a broadcast job. But my intention for the first 15 years of my professional career after I left McGill University was to be someone who was on the air in some live capacity. I had a tremendous adrenaline rush from it. This picture is with Kendra Black. It's taken in St. John, New Brunswick. It was actually, it's a screen grab from a commercial that we did. This is in 1989. And it was a show called Noon Hour, not the most creative uh, name for a show, but uh, it was a daily Monday to Friday, daily hour long show where we interviewed guests and talked about uh, issues that were significant in New Brunswick and around the Maritimes. I eventually came back to Montreal and for the last seven years of my honor career, I was working as a sportscaster. And this was the team that I was with um, in my last job. Dennis Trudeau, one of the great journalists in Canada was the Supper Hour News host. Patricia Rodriguez was our arts uh, reporter and Patty Kim did the weather and features. And so this is a phase of my life where I'm learning uh, intensely how to speak effectively in a public manner. Um, the second phase of, of my professional career is as a, as a producer, mostly for feature length 
uh, documentaries and then also for um, special programming. This is a picture that was taken in Kingston, I think in 2014, maybe 13. And um, for those of you who are sports fans, you'll recognize the two gentlemen that I'm with. That's Ron McLean on the left and Don Cherry. Two people who in their own way also have taught me a lot about um, the art of speaking in public. Um, Ron is, is frankly, in terms of speaking in public, a genius. Uh, and Don, uh, who was very controversial throughout his career, understood some very basics about getting a message that he believed in and that not necessarily everyone else agreed with. Um, Sequoia mentioned uh, some work that I did in 2016 at the Rio Olympics. Before those games, uh, the man in the red shirt is Donovan Bailey, one of the great icons of, uh, of Canada, who's our 100 meter gold medal champion from the Atlanta Olympics 1996. And I was working with him and I've worked with him quite a bit as, uh, as a media coach with him. And in this instance, we were doing a series of profiles and the man on the right with the hat is Lennox Lewis, the former world champion boxer who uh, turns out uh, in this segment that we were shooting uh, in his office, among his many, many skills, and he's really gi giant of a man, by the way, I just can crush your hand when you go to shake his hand, uh, but he's a, at the same time, he's gentle. Um, he's a tremendous uh, table tennis player. Yeah, and you don't see it in this picture, but he has a table tennis uh, set up. And uh, I tried to play him, but I didn't win very many points. His reflexes, being a world champion boxer, are pretty good at table tennis. This is a photo from Rio um, de Janeiro uh, at, the, at the Olympics. So on the right is Mark Tewksbury, uh, and the woman in the red is Clara Hughes. Sequoia mentioned the two of them earlier. They were both Canadian heroes as athletes, but also both tremendous speakers in their own right, very different styles. Um, and I, again, I was inspired by both of them. I learned a lot by watching them. Um, Mark is extremely emotional and passionate and can get a crowd of 500 people to stand up and cheer very quickly in an audience. Clara, as you probably know, has been a tremendous advocate for various things, but especially for mental health. And she has touched many people's lives. Uh, Alexandre Depati is on the left. He's a former diver, another Olympic champion. He's become a broadcaster and in the same way he's touched peoples. And, uh, and the man of the glasses is Hubert Lacroix. He uh, also a, a lawyer who at the time was the, the president of Radio Canada and CBC and was also in his own right, uh, a very effective speaker. So more recently, I've been working with uh, the, some of the staff at Sportsnet. This is Carolyn Cameron. So Carolyn is very, very talented young broadcaster as well. She's actually in New York City tonight. There's a, a playoff game between the New York Rangers and Pittsburgh Penguins that she is uh, working as the ringside reporter. But normally during the season, she is working in the studio as a host. And in this instance, we are at a Rogers Cup tennis tournament. I think it was the first year that she was hosting and I was on site for the week uh, helping her out. And I'm just going to stop with the photos here after we get to this one, which is uh, a shot of me at the podium. So of the course of my work um, in this third act, especially, I get asked uh, quite often to work as an MC at different events. Many of them are through McGill University, which I have an association with. And so this is an awards banquet uh, that was held in Montreal. Uh, the one time a year that I get to wear my McGill bow tie. I'm not a regular bow tie wear, but uh, there you have it. So um, that's a little bit more about me and how I get here. And again, uh, in part, I, I show you some of these photos because of um, not just the experience that I've been able to garner, but also um, to praise those that I've worked with because I, every person that I'm working with is some a person that I'm learning from. And there's another thing too that the better you can be personally at watching someone else and trying to understand what makes them successful, the bigger impact that's going to have on yourself. So it's been a real privilege for me to work with uh, these people of, of excellence, really, in, in all aspects of their life. Today in Montreal uh, was a significant day for another reason. And again, it's sports fans. Sorry for going heavy on the sports, but it just so happens we're in a bit of a vortex right now and the NHL playoffs have just started. But it was the funeral today for Guy Lafleur. And for those who aren't familiar with Guy Lafleur, he was a hockey player 
in the 70s and the 80s here in Montreal and was a, a true hockey icon, um, not just a, someone who was a, a, a favorite of, of hockey fans, but became really a hero across the province of Quebec and for some others uh, across Canada as well. And in certain respects, certainly when we get beyond the Canadian borders for, for hockey fans. He was um, somebody who at the time skated better than anybody else, uh, generated an electricity that was incomparable. And that was one of the reasons why uh, Guy Dafleur became so popular. And um, so unfortunately, Guy at the age of 70 uh, died last week uh, after a relatively long battle with cancer. Today, uh, a what's called a national funeral here in Quebec was held. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau was here. Premier of Quebec, Francois Legault, was also here for that funeral. It was at one of the cathedrals downtown. And it was, it was really a beautiful event. Um, and I watched it with interest, knowing that we were going to be speaking tonight, in part because of the number of people that, in a service like that, at a funeral service, are asked to go speak at their microphone and pay tribute to the person who died. And so, of course, today there were several people who spoke, um, many of the teammates of Guy Lafleur. So from Yvonne Cournoyer to Larry Robinson, Guy Carbonneau, Patrick Roy, they all took to uh, the podium and had a chance to share their feelings. And one of the reasons why I wanna talk a little bit about this is coming back at that idea of the audience and knowing the audience that we have. But I do, I'm gonna share one more picture with you here with regards to this. And it was uh, the last speaker before the religious um, leaders came on. So this is Geneviève Paré. She is the sister-in-law of the late Guy Lafleur. And when she came up, she was to the general public, I think the one who was um, least recognizable or at least known anyways, uh, and probably the one who had uh, spoken the least in, in public in the past. And she gave an, an incredible dedication to Guy Lafleur. Um, she was composed. She, she had, like all the rest of them, had a great text prepared. And she touched on some ideas and painted a picture of Lafleur in a way that none of the others, even though they were teammates, could. And I'm not trying to diminish what the others had said, but she, in my mind anyways, really stood out with what she said. And for those of you that don't know Guy Lafleur, aside from being a, a tremendous hockey player, he was a little bit of a lone wolf, kind of a guy that would do things his own way. He lived fast. And he, unlike some other former players, felt free to speak out against the organization if he felt he should be speaking out against the organization. So he was very frank. And so she described him and she said, you know, one of our family members once said that Guy is a diamond in the rough. And then she said, and the beautiful thing is that he remained rough his whole life. No one was ever able to make, make him shine as a diamond. And everybody started clapping at that point. And it was just like, a, just a beautiful idea that captured the character of the man who died in a way that I don't think anybody else was able to, to do today. So this brings me back to what I was saying earlier, which is, can we think about our audience and what our audience need is when we go into a presentation? At a funeral service, um, we have what I'll call a pretty generous audience that's waiting for us to speak. So just let you think a little bit about what typically from your experience, you think that the audience is expecting to hear. So in my books, the audience is expecting to hear an anecdote or anecdotes and stories about the speaker's connection with the person who has died. And they're expecting to get a sense of emotion. Those are the two fundamental things when people gather for um, to, to honor someone who has passed. Those are the things that they're expecting. They're not really expecting a whole bunch beyond that. And so that makes them uh, a different kind of audience than, let's say, if you're at a wedding, where the feel of the wedding is very much different. Um, and, a very, and an obviously very different audience from um, a group at work where you're speaking to. 
So one of the things that I thought was significant today by watching all those people speak, and again, the hockey players that spoke, you know, they've done media through their career and all that stuff, but they're hockey players first, and then sometimes business people second, and then charitable workers third. They're not usually like public speakers, um, certainly the ones that spoke today, despite their experience. But if in that instance, you can arrive to your point of speaking with a well-prepared document, the words that you are sharing, because you have an audience that's a little more forgiving and is not expecting too much, the words that you are saying are gonna outweigh whether or not you're really nervous and whether or not you're capturing the pronunciation of each word properly. So that's another thing to keep in mind is that there's a relationship that's very fundamental between your thoughts as you organize them, which could be a written text that you're gonna present in a public venue, or could be point form or an outline of some sort. So those are the thoughts. And then there's how I actually deliver it and, and what state is my, my body in and my voice in as I'm speaking. So we'd like to have both those things at their maximum every time that we speak. But when there's a forgiving audience, then do remember that extra energy can go into having excellent words written. And people might be, they're gonna, because they're more forgiving, if your head is down and you're reading the whole time, they'll be listening to the words in that instance. So just getting you to think a little bit about, okay, who am I speaking to? Do I have something written? Am I reading it or am I interpreting it? And do I feel like I'm making connection with my audience if I'm reading it or am I still able to look at my audience? So that relationship is always changing depending on which kind of presentation that you're making. So the take home point of this one is when you have a forgiving audience, they're more tolerant of you actually reading the prepared script. And if you were able to watch today to see all the people that spoke and then their great nerves, they were reading from a paper and while their head didn't get lifted too much to look at the audience, I think the audience really appreciated what they had written down on that piece of paper. So um, this is a key thing in this preparation phase is thinking about, okay, how much do I write? Uh, and to what, what extent am I gonna be writing these things? If I could, I'm gonna now talk a little bit about, as you go into your presentation that you're getting ready for, you're at the stage where you gotta organize these thoughts. And the one mistake that I don't want you to make and that people make all the time is they start with the background information or what we call background and contextual information before throwing something out at the audience that says, oh, I'm just gonna hook you, I'm gonna make you think. So by the way, now I'm gonna interrupt myself and say, I had asked you to think about what that ball cost when the bat and the ball cost $1.10 together, the bat is worth a dollar more than the ball. Just give you a second to think about what your answer is. 95% of the students at Harvard University undergrads who were given this particular quiz answered that the ball is 10 cents. And that is not right. So if the ball is 10 cents and the ball and the bat is worth a dollar more than the ball, then it's going to be a dollar 20 together. So the answer is the ball is actually worth five cents. So ball is five cents, bat is a dollar five together, a dollar 10. So that in my setup tonight, I said, I need to hook you guys with something. I don't know how strong it was and how successful it was, but I just wanted you to think about something. I wanted to draw you in. So trying to start with something that's a hook, that's not necessarily like I'm gonna give you the contextual background to what we're doing tonight is a really important thing. By the way, the reason why we get that wrong and if there's a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, by Daniel Kahneman, really incredible book, came out in 2011, basically captures all the research that he did with his scientific partner through 35 years. Thinking fast and slow, it just challenges us that we sort of have two parts of the brain that are working quite often, and one part of the brain wants to come to solutions quickly and ignores certain key elements. And so in the question, the bat and the ball, 
if the ball costs that much. The brain isn't listening to the whole thing. The brain is actually just trying to associate, oh, I see that ball, that bat is a dollar. That's what I heard, a dollar. And together they're dollar 10, so that ball must be 10. But the brain has stopped thinking about the fact that the question said a dollar more than the other. So um, that was an example of the hook. I want to talk a little bit more about the hook and, and how you might um, sort of dream that up when you're doing a presentation. My first memory actually, or I shouldn't say it's my first, one of my early memories of, of being exposed to a hook and not even knowing it at the time, uh, I was fortunate enough at the age of 13 to travel to uh, Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, my uncle was working there with his family with Sita and uh, we'd gone to spend for a couple of weeks, my parents and my brother and I. Uh, so I was 13 years old at the time. And one day they said, oh, we're gonna go to, I don't remember what the center was, but we're gonna go hear this man named Richard Leakey give a lecture. And so I'm 13 and I'm like, I don't go to lectures, but I guess I gotta go to this lecture. And uh, Richard Leakey, of course, uh, renowned paleo um, anthropologist, who did tremendous work uh, in, in the conservation area, but also on, on tracing the origins of species uh, and of course of humans. And I still to this day remember how he started, which was he got to the microphone and he said, hello everybody. He said, if some of you are wondering in the scope of history where human beings fit in relation to the history of the planet, think of the Bible, he said. And then think of the last page of the Bible and the last word on that last page. And that relationship of that word to the rest of the content in the Bible is the relationship of the history of human beings and the history of the planet. And it was a, like a beautiful little anecdote or analogy, if you want to call it that, that I still remember to this day. And it was just a great way to draw his audience into some of the findings that he was gonna be talking about, which were a little bit more technical in terms of the research that they're doing at the time in the seventies in Kenya, which is also similar to uh, when I was in Sejep. And so for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the Sejep system here in Quebec, we go up to grade 11 and then in grade the equivalent of 12 and 13, we have a system called Sejep. And so when I was in Sejep, uh, for some reason, I still don't know today, I was studying pure and applied sciences which didn't really take me anywhere, but I had a chemistry class. And in that chemistry class, I had a, a, a British teacher who started one class by saying, you know, you can't make a good cup of tea at the top of Mount Everest. And, and I was like, well, this is a funny way to start. And that whole lecture was on uh, air pressure and uh, one of the uh, many impacts of air pressure changing is that the boiling temperature of water at a higher altitude is lower than it is at sea level, quite a bit lower. So um, the saying was that, yeah, you can make a cup of tea, but it's not really a cup of tea because the water is not at the same hot temperature as it would be. So those are a couple of examples of people who started a presentation with something that has a hook quality that's going to make people think, oh, okay, I want to hear more about this. And so every time that we tell a story, we should be thinking about how can I start? So this applies to our public presentations as well. So I just give you one more. So just before COVID, I was working with a bunch of people who were working on the technological side of a, a broadcast company. And there's about a hundred of them and they're trying to figure out ways to make the online, um, online consumption, the digital consumption of the network uh, more effective. And so these scientists basically were being asked to present A, publicly, but also within the company. And they were having a little bit of trouble getting their message across. And so the one person that I was working with, she described this whole technological system, which 90% of it, I just couldn't, I couldn't understand the first time she explained it. It was just well beyond my understanding. But as we talked it through, I realized what she was trying to fundamentally say was that the notion that the general public has that the number of hits that you get on a website, the number of people who are tuning in that kind of thing through digitally is not as significant as people think it is. And that they were developing tools 
which were showing other signs of significance, other ways to demonstrate significance. So with that, we then altered the, her presentation that she was gonna be making to, to use uh, an analogy. And so we said, okay, look, we have two cruise ships. This was before COVID. <laughs> two cruise ships who show up to the same port in Bermuda. They both have 400 people showing up to the port. You would assume automatically that those, each ship has the same value to the people on the island of Bermuda and to the people who are running the market there because they both have 400 people on board and they're all gonna, let's say, descend from the boat at the same rate. However, if I then tell you that one of the boat has 400 people who are gonna get off without any money, no credit cards, no cash, but they're just gonna visit, and the other boat has people with money, then we immediately see that those two cruise ships are not of the same value to the island of Bermuda. And so that was the analogy that she used to get into her presentation for those who weren't as technically savvy as her and her team to sort of understand, oh, okay, now I'm getting it. There's like a different way to, to measure this. So that um, is another example of trying to find a hook. So there's a model that we call hook one, two, three. And I'm just gonna explain them to you in a second. But so for the hook, that thing that's gonna grab people, it can be an analogy. It can be a strong um, position, like an opinion. Uh, it could be a short and also powerful summary that's gonna hit people. Um, these are like typical things that could end up being part of a really sort of defining a hook. The other thing that you could be getting with um, a hook is, and this is quite typical, taking people to a particular moment, to a particular scene. I'll come back to that one second. Once you've hooked the people, then you can step back and use your background and contextual information, which sort of helps people understand, okay, why are we talking about this? Where are we at right now? And then that's the one in the hook, one, two, three. And then two is the next section of what you're organizing. That's the heart of what you want to talk about. Now, if you're telling a good story, as you know, there's a line of tension. And the line of tension usually represents what's going on, why is it going on, why is it relevant? Those are like the heart and meat of any story. And as we're discussing what's going on, why it's happening, why it's relevant, we have forces that are for this kind of pursuit of the what and why and other forces that are against it. And that's what ends up being at the heart of your presentation. And that's usually what we call number two. And then in the three, the last section is where we're gonna close out our presentation. And oftentimes the closing out the presentation is given everything that I've just said, this is where things are at today. So it's a little bit like looking forward, moving forward. We're stopping short of saying tomorrow we'll bring what tomorrow brings because that's redundant. But we want to be able to say, okay, this is, this is where things are at. So that's the hook one, two, three, in terms of organizing your content when you want to bring your presentation um, into to form, which is, uh, I think, one of the most useful tools that you can take away. If you want to practice this, and please do practice this, if you want to practice this on, on your own, you can practice it simply by answering the everyday questions that you get from people. So somebody's going to say to you, hopefully, hey, you took part in that uh, Vaughn Public Library session on the art of public speaking. What was it like? So we give two typical answers to those vague questions. Number one, we say, ah, it was it's cool. Yeah, it was good. Ah, it wasn't so good. Yeah, you wore this funny jacket. Or Sometimes we end up giving a chronological answer, which is sort of like a safe answer. So we're saying, well, we clicked on, we talked about this, we talked about that, we talked about this, and we finally got to this, and then we were done. So it's not wrong to give people those answers, but those are like sort of the two forms that we often you know, adhere to when people say, how was your day? How was your weekend? What was it like at work today? Oh, you saw your son, you haven't seen him in a while. Oh, you saw your daughter. Oh, you saw your, you know, your teacher from high school. What was that like? So in those instances where you can practice is to go find a moment that was like something that really got your attention or that might get someone else's attention. 
So, you know, if you ask me, um, well, if the day that that picture was taken, if you said the next day, how are you there? So, oh my God, I had this moment. I was looking in my dad's eyes. We had a connection. It's a connection that replaces the words that we used to share with each other. Most of the time he's walking around, he doesn't even know who I am, you know, and, and he, we can't share words. And then, so that would be my hook. And people would say, oh, wow, what's, what's he talking about? And then I could talk about the haircut. And then I could talk about anything else I want during the day and wherever I want to go with it. So do think of that in trying to, to find your, your hook. Bob, I'm just going to interrupt you for one moment. Is somebody that? has, a, yeah, somebody has asked if you could repeat uh, number two, please. Right. So number two is the background and contextual information to whatever it is you're talking about. So let's say today um, I was asked about, tell me about the Gila Fleur funeral. So I'd say, I'd start off by saying, I was so touched and moved by his sister-in-law referring to Gila Fleur as a diamond in the rough. And the beautiful thing is that he was left rough his whole life. He was, ne he was never polished. So that would be my hook. So now the background and context is I got to let the audience know, like, what's this about? So this is what I'd say. She was speaking at the funeral today. Guy Lafleur died last week. He was a hero in Quebec. He played for the Montreal Canadiens, was one of the best hockey players of all time. So that would be the background and context. And then I could say in the next section, which is wherever I want to go with this story about the funeral. But that background and context is kind of just letting people know the framing of where is this hook coming from and where are we going with this story? And so I'm glad you asked that question as a follow-up because um, if you're someone who tends to speak too long, which most of us are, and look at me, I'm already at like 740 here plus, is that we, um, we tend to give too much background information. And it's, it's the background information that we can tighten up. So let's take a, a topic that's really not a great topic right now, but the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And let's say I'm talking about something today where I heard that this was going on with the Russian government. My next step is the background and context. I can say the background and context in one sentence, which is, you know, seven, eight weeks ago, the Russian government invaded Ukraine and made nuclear threats to everyone across the world. And that's all I need to say. But if I'm in a mode where I'm going too long in the background and context, now I'm going to start to like tell the whole story that probably most people are, are aware of, right? And so that's also a little bit of, um, um, for people who are presenting them in a, in a professional context um, or in a technical context, there is a tendency to start with number two with the background and context. So they say, you know, two years ago, we decided that we were going to look into the origins of, uh, of this species in northern British Columbia. Uh, this species was first identified, blah, blah, blah. It's all the background and context, right? But there's something else in the story that we got to find a hook to start. And then when you get to, to the background, and sorry, <laughs> I realized I didn't answer this properly, did I? So I'm, when the background and context is the one and the hook, one, two, three. So two, sorry catching myself my apologies everybody the two in 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 the hook one two three is really the the heart of your story so the heart of your story is something that's driven by okay what is it that let's say the funeral what is it i wanted to say about the funeral today beyond that anecdote off the top what's at the heart of it why do i want to say it why is it relevant so that's what's going to define what, what i'm going to say um, let's go back to the example of um, the person who is a tech expert at a broadcast company. So she ended up saying, okay, here, after the background and context was explained, she's saying, okay, here's this new system. This is essentially how it works. This is how I want you people to embrace it. And this is fundamentally going to change how you understand who's consuming and how they consume your product. And ultimately, it's going to end up having an impact on the revenue that you generate through the content that you're putting out there because you have a better understanding of how this digital content is being consumed. So that's the what's happening. Got to make a decision about that, why it's happening, why it's relevant. That's always the thing that's going to gonna create a good uh, line of tension in your story. 
okay, if, if uh, this is sort of um, the one part tonight that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving you a real Coles Notes version. Um, and, and trust me, if you're trying to get your head around it, uh, it is something that people who do storytelling for, for their career end up working on, working on, working on. But if there's just one thing you can take away, just if you could say, every time I'm telling a story, I'm speaking publicly, I gotta have a hook element. And it, it can be five seconds, like it could be a minute or two minutes, depends on what you decide to use for, for your hook. I wanna share a picture of uh, someone who uh, I had a chance to, another former athlete who I had a chance to coach and then become a collaborator with over the last five years. And his name is Adam Creek. Um, he's a giant of a man, probably uh, six foot four, six foot five. Uh, this is him in Rio. Uh, we're on a beach. And this is the uh, second year of him doing some broadcast work at the time. His name became recognizable in 2008 when he was part of Canada's uh, rowing eight man boat that won the gold medal in Beijing. And um, so he's a tremendous athlete. He's someone who also, with three other people, tried to row across the Atlantic Ocean. They got 71 days in. And on that 71st day, a big wave came and uh, they were overturned and they were lucky to survive. It was quite a harrowing experience. Um, if you want to find out more, he does have a TED Talk, Adam Creek, K-R-E-E-K, K-R-E-E-K. -E -E and uh, he, in that uh, presentation, talks about um, failure and uh, how you deal with failure. And so he's someone who actually embraces failure because he does believe that it pushes you to heights that you otherwise wouldn't be able to reach. And um, so I was speaking with him yesterday and I said, Adam, do you mind if I share a story that he had once shared with me? So he's since become one of the top motivational speakers in North America, and he's a senior executive coach. So he's speaking to people all the time. Very, very successful, very good. But it didn't start that way. And I bring this up because there's going to be people who uh, I know are like, okay, well, I had a bad experience or I'm scared of that bad experience. And Adam, in his, after he won the gold medal, um, it was about a year later, he's in Northern Alberta. He gets a gig to speak to a high school there. And he gets up on stage, the kid, and he's just overwhelmed with nerves and he can barely get a word out and he doesn't really make sense. And he babbles and babbles and babbles. And he gets off the stage and the principal takes him aside. He says, I'm going to be frank with you, Adam. He said, that's the worst presentation we've ever had at the school. So you can imagine how crushing that makes you feel. Um, but Adam is the type of guy that when there's a challenge, he wants to take it on. And I'm just, I wrote down the notes from my conversation with him last night. And because um, I said, like, how do you go from that moment to being one of the best, right? Um, so he said to me last night, he says, when you have an experience like that, you have to lean into the emotions. And that was a really interesting expression. You got to lean into the emotions that you're feeling and then figure out what values you've violated. So that's a pretty, like, there's a lot in that sentence. But... So in other words, I'm feeling terrible. I just got to let myself feel it. And then I got to say, okay, how did I, like, what did I do? Like, am I a total victim here? Or is there something that I did that was uh, contributing to this? And so that's where his notion of the value is being violated. So that permitted him to say, you know what? I need to prepare more. And I need to be clear on my message. Uh, and so that is ultimately connected to his value system. And he knows that he does believe in having impact and he believes in achievement. But those things come with preparation and practice. So those are fundamental things that he feels about himself in life. And they're all connected. And so that first step was, okay, like I wanted to have achievement, but I didn't do it. I wanted to have impact, I didn't do it. Partly because normally I prepare for things 
I normally have practice and I didn't. I just thought I could come in and do this, right? So preparation and practice and trying to figure out what you do to prepare and practice are really, really important. And then I'm just gonna, there's a mantra that he does and not everybody's into mantras, but this is a mantra that uh, he uses, which is pretty powerful for me anyways. So this, and in fact today, so he had like a full day presentation that he was giving to uh, the company. So before he goes in, he'll say this out loud to himself, you are exact, you are exactly what the room needs to hear right now. Let go and listen to the needs of the room and respond and trust your intuition. I, just really, I really like this. I'm going to see if you don't mind, I'm going to read it again. So you are exactly what the room needs to hear right now. Let go and listen to the needs of the room and respond and trust your intuition. I think that's pretty good. So that kind of helps me morph into um, uh, dealing with how, how do I get to the space that I'm in? I'm just going to look at the time here. Okay. We did have one more question. I don't yes, know. Yes, please go. Much time, yeah. so. Okay, somebody asked if you could please go over your example of the Russian invasion using the hook one, two, and three. Right. Okay. So um, if let's say, and, and, and I, I'm, it's such a sensitive story that I, I don't want to play too much make believe here. Um, but let's say, the, the story that I want to tell, this is a true story. This is a story about an American physician from Philadelphia who decided to leave her kids with the grandparents and go with her husband to fly into Poland and then to get into Ukraine and then get to, I think, back to Poland and to treat um, refugees coming across the border into Poland for three weeks. So let's say that's the that's the story. So my hook in that one um, could be um, Dr. Jones, whatever her name is, um, for the first time in her life, left her kids with the grandparents, three kids under the age of 10, knowing that she was about to board a plane and enter a part of the world at the moment, which has the one of the most difficult points of conflict uh, and where life is not insured. So let's say that's my hook. So I, I painted a little picture of this person dropping her kids off. So now that's my hook. Hopefully I've got the attention of people that I'm speaking with. And then I'll take a step back and say, well, Dr. Jones is a family practitioner in Philadelphia, but she has Ukrainian roots and when she heard of the conflict that was unfolding as a result of the Russian invasion, she decided she needed to do something and her husband was on board. And so that's why they left their kids and headed off for a three week journey. So that's my background and context. So now the two in the hook, one, two, three, the heart of the story is now I'm gonna get into, okay, she gets over to Poland, you know, she flies into Warsaw, the challenge of getting transport to whatever border town she was gonna be in. What did she see when she saw there? What was her reaction to it? Um, what were the, did they have money that they had to use? Were they, you know, how are they eating? What could she tell me about the, you know, the, the refugees that were coming across the border? And then ultimately building towards what was driving her? What's her motivation? And how did she, you know, even decide to, to do what for most of us, I think it seems to be like a pretty big risk, right? Um, when you're leading a safe slash comfortable life uh, in the United States in Philadelphia. And so that would be what I would explore in, in number two. And then maybe my last part, which is where does that leave us now? I'd say she's completed her three weeks. She made it back to be with her kids, uh, but she's already thinking about making a return trip before the end of June to help out with the refugees again. So that's sort of, I, I, that's on the spot, that's how I would organize the content on that story. Okay, so I'm gonna do like a two minute sort of run through two things 
and we're just gonna have to do this again. Um, and then if anybody has uh, questions, like I don't mind going past eight o'clock. So fire away with your questions either in, in the chat or if uh, you wanna please uh, come on microphone and camera and, and express it that way. Very happy to take the questions. So the two things I wanted to take away that has to do with the delivery phase. So we've talked, I think enough about the preparation phase. The delivery phase, the biggest complaint I get is I'm nervous. Like I'm sweating, I can't breathe and all that stuff. So if you could think of a couple of things. So one is what is my body position when I'm actually, I'll call it my set position starting to speak. The most important thing, I'm gonna stand back a little bit. I'm not sure you can't really see it, but you wanna, wanna make sure that the weight on your legs is evenly distributed 50-50. Seems kind of obvious, but a lot of the times we're leaning one way or we're leaning the other way. The one leg's bent, hands are like this. We need to have the evenly balanced on both legs. And for some people, depending on where you're speaking, you actually want to have your legs offset, but still 50-50. This is going to make a huge difference uh, for reasons that I don't have time to get into, but in terms of helping settle you and also making sure that this part of your body is where your breath is going to come from. As soon as I get on one leg, now my stomach down here gets all tight. My breath can only come from here. But as I get 50-50 and I'm balanced, now this is open and relaxed. So when I get nervous and I tense up, and if I'm already in a position where my body's not, not right, now I'm going to be stuck here with my breath and I'm just gonna be more nervous and like the more I talk, I'm gonna give you like that. So many people have gone through that and hopefully you haven't, but most of us have felt that at some point. So one way, it's not the only way, but one thing is can I be in the right physical position? And this is something also, I, I refer to it as grounding. Um, and there's again, a lot that can be said about grounding, but essentially it's about getting the body in a balanced position. And you can practice this like when you're standing in line at the bank or at the grocery store, when you're having a discussion with someone that you're with, um, just getting used to being in this position and staying relaxed but firm and make sure this is open and you're getting full breath. So that's the one thing I want you to take away because that's, that's gonna help settle you when you're speaking. I talked earlier about where you're looking, but the other thing is if you can on a regular basis, do some form of breathing exercise. So we don't think of doing breathing exercises because we're, we just breathe naturally, right? But what happens is we're not really fully expanding our thoracic cage, most of us, when we breathe. And that's another thing that's controlling the tension. So, and you can go on YouTube and probably many of you had, and if you've done yoga, you've tried all sorts of different breathing things. The hard part is to find a technique that you'll do on a regular basis. And, and most people, they just like, they don't. So one simple one for me is if you put your hands on, the, on your side of your rib cage, both sides, and when you're breathing in, pull those, push your hands out. So take as long a breath as possible and then And then another big one in. If you do 10 of those, just like that, when you're having a shower, once a day, try to tie it to something, that's gonna get your brain into more of an automatic deep breathing routine. So you won't have to do it when you're presenting, but you're able to react by getting full breath. One other technique, it's relatively new. So if you're someone who's really nervous and all that stuff, and you're like, oh my God, the adrenaline's too much, I gotta calm down. So you take, two inhales interrupted by a pause and then have a big sigh. So, and if you can do inhale by the nose, it's better. So I'll, I'll do an example for you. So it's. Do it one more time. So that, um, Apparently, what's, there's some, something happening. To, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm not pretending to be. But from what I've read and what I've heard, you're impacting the amygdala. And that's uh, a great way to um, 
reduce the unwanted adrenaline flow. So one, I, I there's one. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we do have to wrap it up pretty quick. There is one more question: um, yeah. How best to close with impact and leave a lasting, great impression? Yeah, I love that. So, a couple of things there. One is a lot of times our presentations are they have a part of improvisation or we're from a plan, and so sometimes we forget that we got to close and we got to close strong. So closing strong is partly the content, but it's also partly where are you at? So if you fade at any, that's not a strong close, right? So sometimes it's, remember when I was talking before about content and your physical capability and where you're at, the, the more convinced you are of your end, the stronger you're gonna be and the stronger feeling you're gonna leave with people. So. It's in part, the first step to that is to get, okay, what is my end? How do I close this? Um, and depending, so it kind of depends in terms of the content, what the topic is. Like I said, most people struggle with like, what, what do I bring here at the end? If you can bring something new or a surprise, that's great, why not? Um, and sometimes it's another anecdote at the finish, depending on the style of, of thing that you're saying. The sort of classic, okay, now I'm gonna summarize point A, B, C, D, E, and F that's kind of, that, that fades a little bit. So not everyone is gonna stick with like a long form summary. Um, so you're looking for something with a little punch for sure. It comes from the idea usually that we've done this, we got here and as a result of this, this is the consequence. So that, that is often good. And remember too, that there is this thing called closing the loop. So uh, for instance, you know, the hook, if you can make reference to what your hook was at the beginning, that's often one way to close. So sometimes this bat and ball thing, which I've used for other presentations, I wait to the very end. And I'm like, oh, by the way, here's the answer to that thing. And it's a fun way to close, right? So making reference to how you started one way, shape or form is usually a good formula for a strong close and, and often presents an opportunity for humor, something we didn't really talk about tonight. I see there's another question now. Um, somebody says, thank you for the great presentation. All the best with your father and always remember you're a good and caring son. Oh, that's such a nice thing to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's been really wonderful to, to have you. I'm sure we've all um, really enjoyed hearing the great, the great advice, the great tips that you've given us. Um, I will be sending out your handout either tonight or tomorrow morning. And um, I don't see any other questions. So I think we're, we're gonna wrap it up now. Thank you so much. Somebody else is saying awesome presentation and, and uh, thank you for sharing. Okay. Thank you guys. Uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come and take part in this. This is something I'm really passionate about, so. Nice to have, have uh, some people show some interest. This is great. Really appreciate you doing this. Thank you again, Bob. Okay. All right, guys. Take Bye. care. Bye.